This presentation is both about how uh, security works and all about my experiences from the teams that I work with and working specifically with security. For the last two years, I've worked as a, like 60% in development backend team and 40% in the security teams to help from the both ions to implement secure processes. So this is actually one of the beginnings why we have the problem. In 2013, there's this report from Verizon where they actually investigated well, 47,000 incidents, 621 actually known security breaches, and uh, it was a wide uh, report. It's pretty, pretty interesting to read. You have a link there and it will be available later on. Uh, companies of all sizes. But one of the important takes from that presentation or that report is actually they found that 78 of these uh, in intrusions or incidents were simple to pull off. They said that it could be anyone without knowledge of the actual system they were attacking or without any specific tools for attacking it, they could do it from the web or from any other external part. It was simple to pull off. And that's pretty disturbing that it's simple to pull off. Um, so it feels like we don't really think about security that much in our current work. So I found another report talking about, okay, what do we feel from the inside, from the developer's perspective or security officer's perspective? And PC Advisor had a little report there saying, okay, they had put these different statements towards developers and security officers. And that security officer was either chief security officers in the company or any other person in the company that had the same role. So they asked, okay, or they had the statement, security of application is not addressed at their company then. And the uh, interesting value is if 70% of all developers said, yeah, we don't really think about it. It's a high number. Uh, and the 50% of the security officer, okay, they actually had a security officer at that company, which is, should say that they think about security maybe. But they still thought, 50% of the security officers think that in their company that they worked, they was, they, uh, they wasn't actually addressed. They more or less had put a role on it, just blame role, more or less. Uh, then they had the question, do you have a way, uh, security built in as a statement, or so saying we are building uh, application with security uh, knowledge or thinking when we do it, when we have a secure development life cycle. Uh, and there, so do you have that in your company? Well, there is none, and 80% of developers said there is none, and 67 said that there wasn't none. And then they had an interesting question, which was, okay, do, have you had a breach the last two years? Just to get a little feeling, how did they actually feel like? And th there was quite an interesting number. 70% of developers said, yeah, we have had a breach. Only 47% of the security officers agreed that <laughs> they had a breach the last two years. And then, uh, do you have, get any kind of training in your company for around security? Around 50% had that. And do your application meet security regulations? Regulations being, well, uh, laws for different kinds, uh, uh, the PCI for uh, card industry, the health regulations, or whatever you, your application is working around. And that was even lower than ever. <coughs> so we have a, a, there is a, bad state right now talking about security. It's not a lot of people actually think that's uh, used. We might have a security office to actually say something though. So then walking into the agile world, when I started working in agile, coming from security, coming from setting processes and finding out having penetration tests in the end, maybe having some requirements in the beginning, what we thought about it, coming into the agile world, it sort of changed a lot of that. Because now we can't have, well, should we have penetration tests every sprint? Whoa, uh, what do we mean? What, what, when should we do it? What does it mean? And there, there were some words that sort of conflicted here. I'm out of reach sometimes. Yeah? Something. In the agile mo world, we have the motto saying what we do, what's in the sprint. We shouldn't really do more. We shouldn't absolutely not do less. We should agree with what's in the sprint. That's our plan, right? So we shouldn't do if it's not in the sprint. And in the agile world, a lot of people use XP, extreme programming, which can use uh, pair programming and other methodologies, which is really good. 
Um, and that's more, the motto around there is you should never generalize. You should write more code than you actually need. And you should make sure that whatever you write is something that will be used because it's often worse to actually generalize. And we have to TDD, which is coding until it's green. All of this says that, okay, if it's gonna be in the application, you need to make sure it's in the requirements, which is tough since security is talking about, often talked about as a non-functional requirement, as we've heard before today. And I'm gonna be in this all time. Requirements and code shouldn't fit. You have all these requirements, you have the code, you never sort of implement all the requirements, and you often have implementation that is not in the requirements. You have the framework, you have the, develop, the deployment part, you have all the part that's not actually a requirement of the system, but that also often means that it's not tested. So a lot of problems are outside in this area of things that you have implemented that's not part of actual requirements or actually stories or parts of your system. So we have all these problems of what is a secure uh, application and you're not really having it as a requirement currently. So what is a secure application? Let's start there because that sounds vague, right? When is an application secure? Is it when we have this, okay, it's hard to guess the passwords in the system. We have a policy saying it should be all these different classes and so on. Or is it that we actually have input validation of uh, all the fields getting into? Is it that we have uh, all our third party software that we use, we know that they are patched and they haven't released a new security patch that we haven't applied? Is, is that secure? Well, all of them actually means that the software is probably more secure than before. But the thing is, we need to make it get to this area, that as software is secure, when it fulfills the security requirements of the application. Because all of these might not actually be interesting. For if we have the banking application or the web shop of your site, and we have the lunch menu application that you also write internally, those shouldn't have the same security requirements. There's no reason to make sure that the lunch menu application has the same requirements as the other application. <coughs> so we need to make sure that we have uh, an idea of how do we get the difference between these two. Hmm? So in the end, I'm pushing to, uh, a lot around, okay, can we get the product owners to actually know about security, to get the requirements in there? Well, that's always hard because they are not really interested in security from the beginning. Might not be, at least. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, so how, uh, the, the way that I, we talked about, so if you are a developer or you're a different, how do product owners actually get requirements that is non-functional? Because they are the ones that owns uh, the, the decision of what's important in the application. And right now we have all the other non-functional requirements which is like deployability, you have performance on how to code it. And that's, uh, that for a product owner, you get that information from other parts of the organization, even though it's not functional requirement from the client. And it should be the same for security. Mm -hmm. So, where do we get help for that? There are secure software development life cycles available that different companies have started. Um, since is it Windows XP, they started with the trustworthy computing in Microsoft. Uh, was it before? Vista maybe? Uh, where they decided this doesn't work anymore. Uh, we need to sort it. So they started uh, the Microsoft Secure Development Lifecycle. Uh, we have Adobe that has started their uh, Secure Product Lifecycle. Uh, we have OVASP, the Open Web Security Application Project that has a PLOS project talking about secure life cycles. And Sigital have their own touch points, which is pretty outdated now, but still uh, available. All of these are available to read on the, online or in books. Microsoft have published their whole de de life cycle in several books now. This is their agile version where they actually say that we have to have feedback loop as well, because that wasn't part of the first couple of issues they did. But now they are talking Agile as well. And Adobe has published at least parts of there. They might not really be up to standard yet, if some people agree. 
Adobe still has a lot of issues, but they have an interesting way of telling that people should work with security. They have these ninjas. You get a belt depending on how, 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 high, up, how high up in the hierarchy you are uh, in security-wise. Whenever you get a course, you get a new belt. And uh, the class and the touch points are still quite uh, waterfall-y in their way. So I took ideas, exactly as the previous uh, presenters has talked about, taking ideas, this echo is annoying, uh, taking ideas from different parts of this and trying to get what can you do in an agile team. Microsoft's uh, agile version of secure development lifecycle is perfect if you're Microsoft. And Adobe's is pretty good if you're Adobe. As any other of these defined processes, they will never apply to any other project, but there are good ideas from there. You're welcome. So Microsoft has a lot of ideas of that you should have a, uh, different roles for everything. They have a privacy officer looking at privacy, and they have a uh, incident officer looking at incident, and they have a lot of people in different roles that they should have, which makes it hard for anybody else to use. Uh, but there's good ideas in many of these. Sort of like, it seems like a timeout somewhere. So uh, a year ago, I started to collect all of these uh, ideas, what we use in a little folder called Secure Coding in Five Minutes. I think you have got it in your bag, if you want to look at it later on, which is about these seven points, which is uh, sort of similar to any uh, uh, other things around Agile, but it's still needed for secure coding. And the idea was that, okay, first step one is taking responsibility for your code. We have a similar project called uh, Clean Code by Uncle Bob. And have you heard of it? See a couple of hands? Yeah. Uh, Uncle Bob has written a book called Clean Code where he says, okay, get back the, uh, the honor in coding that whatever you write, you should actually be proud of. Don't leave stuff that you're not proud of because nobody gains from that. And it's some part of the scout honor uh, uh, thinking there as well. The scout saying that uh, don't uh, always leave a campground uh, better looking than when you came there. So if you are into code, if you are in, in parts of the code, clean up after others mess as well. And it's taking responsibility for code and making sure that you, whenever you leave or deliver anything, you should agree. Sorry? It's an echo. I think I'm hearing voices here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> part two is quite common when you talk about security. Never trust data. Which is about that whenever you get input from users or from other system or might even be parts of your system, you shouldn't trust it because you never know that it's the correct format, the correct information. Make sure that you at least you, uh, you clean it up if you ever have to take, uh, receive it. We have a threat modeling part where you talk about, okay, let's do threat modeling. Threat modeling sounding really boring, but it's all about trying to figure out what are the requirements of the application. I'm gonna go further into that. We have the part, keep yourself updated. And that means both understanding what security is and making sure that the application is updated. It's pretty hot in here, right? People are already falling asleep after lunch here. Um, we had a part saying make a fuss, fuss testing. Any of you heard about fuss testing? Perfect. I'm going to go talk a little more about that later on. And again, staying proud of your code, <coughs> making sure that uh, you actually, uh, whatever you deliver, should be uh, what you're proud of and the legacy code, what do you do with that? A little discussion around that. And the last one was uh, use the best tools. That's a little in this in five and we worked a little more around that. From that, I'm now currently working at, uh, as a consultant, helping different clients to implement ideas around this. And uh, uh, I'm also helping all the small teams in Softhouse to get a little threat modeling on, uh, and security going. And we're working with that last two years. Um, oops, sorry. I made a little small recipe that I've applied for all these small teams that I've found working. It only have five points. So you don't get the uh, seven you have to go through, only five. This is a little step-by-step -step thing that we have added to all new uh, teams 
from small to big to at least get secured into the idea of how to work. So this is my little short recipe of what works. <coughs> Which concludes an architectural view, threat modeling session, new requirements, tools and activities. And I'm going to th now go through these, this recipe and see what you think about it in the end. Which is what I've, uh, I've found out actually works. So architectural overview. How many here has an architectural overview of this system? Or at least know where to find it? Perfectly agile, right? This isn't the common ca case when you go into an agile team. Nobody has an architectural image. Because it's not needed. It's an artifact that we don't want. Is often the idea. But uh, when we're talking about security and talking about where are the issues, we found that we need some kind of image to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. So often step one for us has been going in, okay, you don't have an image. Let's create an image, so at least we have something to talk around. And it can be something like this, that very simple image. You have the website, you have the database, you have the data, just an example image. It can even be like this, just a whiteboard uh, image. At least you have something, you need to have an image to talk about. And when you say you don't have an architectural overview, you might, even, you might actually have something like this at least. So we take the team, we set them down and say, okay, what do you have? Draw it. And they draw an image, something like this. Um, because they never have an image either, exactly as you guys. And if they don't have an image, we often push them to look at the image in a data flow diagram way. Data flow diagram is a way of how do you describe a system with the data flow. It only has four entities, which is pretty simple to remember. So it's the sources and things, which means external uh, things that you don't control. You have your own processes, your own data stores, and you don't uh, data items moving between these. Cool. So it's a pretty simple way to uh, draw an image. So you have your external entities sending data into different parts of the application and drawing it up. So if you don't have an image, data flow diagram is a really good way of just describing the system in a simple way. The, the team that, uh, how do they do this? Many teams draw it on the board and then they put it in VCO and they try to keep it going there. Might be hard. Uh, the, the team where it works really best is we had a whiteboard. They drew their diagram on the whiteboard and they kept it there because it was their whiteboard uh, next to their daily stand-up. So whenever there was a daily stand-up, they had the whiteboard and could talk around it uh, straight there. <coughs> but is it agile then? What? No more artifacts. Not on my watch. Um, it's another artifact, I agree, and it helps. So that's why I want to do it. Having this kind of image have helped the teams actually know what they're talking about and helping what are we talking about in the system and getting an overview. Having a stable team is a luxury. It's not all teams that actually keep stable of sprint after sprint. You often have coming in, going out in the team and you need to some kind get the new members uh, an overview of what are we talking about. Having this one image is perfect for that. You don't need to have a whole documentation of how the system works. An image is great. We had an issue that we uh, had an Android client and an iPhone client talking to the same web, well, API. They had done their own work, there were two teams, they had discussions, but then when we draw their diagrams, we find, oh, you're actually logging in different ways in these two systems. Why? Nobody had noticed. So just by drawing this, we found discrepancies with how they communicated with the system because they had uh, never really talked about that part before. And one really important stuff is that, w at least within this team, you have one terminology of stuff. You're not talking about the database, which might be like the store, or the procedures, or the server, or the databases can be anything. Or the server is an even worse word, or the API. You sort of get a name of different parts of the system and you have one terminology. It's okay that the different teams have different terminology for same stuff. At least you know what that team called that. 
because we have a big API at the client. Uh, some teams call it the API, some call it the client's name API, or they call it something else. But at least we know that team calls it that, and we can have that. Within their code, they have their own domain. It's okay, we know what it is. There is an image. So if you don't do anything else in your team, just draw an image, have it there. If you don't think it's worth the money to continually have that in Visio or any other graph database, well, skip that. Take a, draw it up on a whiteboard and take a photo. Now you have it. Next time, it's not that hard to draw it again and change it, take a new photo, if that's the reason. So that's one of the things that I've really pushed, trying to get an image of how does the system looks like. Because it's really hard to talk about the system without knowing how it looks like. So that's my part one in this step. Step two is called threat modeling. And threat modeling has is different words of saying getting to know what can go wrong. You can do a really uh, elaborate threat modeling if you have the time and effort to do that. But doing a small one is better than is better than none. And threat modeling is about, okay, we have this system. These parts talk to each other. What can go wrong? Can anybody change the data in between here? Could anybody try to access this at some, as someone else? Uh, or ideas are, so the first session that we do is taking this agile, oh, this architectural overview that we have in somehow, and just have a brainstorming session talking about what can go wrong, step one. The testers are really good at finding ideas of what could go wrong. The developers, not so good. It's really, really hard to think as a hacker when you are a good developer sometimes. Because you, don't you should just go down to technicalities and say, well, nah, that won't work. We have solved it somewhere down here, I think. And, we have and you have to talk about discussions about technology and stuff. But that's not really interesting. Keep the technology out of this. What could go wrong? Let's talk about how we solve it later. Step one, just talk about it. So we have a brainstorming session just saying, okay, we this, 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 and then afterwards we write it down and then we go through and see which of these are actually sorted somehow. Because then we have a tracking of what we think is solved as well. Uh, and then the following sessions we do threat modeling, we have a little and talk about added identities. We have this overview. Whenever the overview changes, that's when we have to make sure that at least we have a new threat modeling session. There's a lot of companies doing it a lot more often than that. And it, of course, it depends on your software. The consultancy answer, wasn't it? It depends. But at least doing one is really good. Getting to know what you have, and then you need to sort of uh, continue up with new stuff that's in there. And if you've never done a threat modeling session before, which probably you haven't, this is the way I do it. I uh, take it straight off Microsoft. This is how they have written, uh, they, they do threat modeling, which is what they use in Stride. Stride. Spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. And the idea is that these are the ways that you can attack a system. Every type of attack can be put in one of these categories. So what we do is that we talk about each of the different parts of the diagram and ask, okay, can we do spoofing? Spoofing meaning I'm somebody else than I'm saying that I am. I'm trying to fool the system who I am. Can I do that here somehow? Tampering meaning can I change the data somehow, either between different nodes or processes or in a stored database? Can I change something? Would we notice? Is it okay? Repudiation is a really hard way of saying it wasn't me. So that means, can I somehow make that the logs doesn't show that I've done this? Or it, do we don't even have any logs of that? Or is there a way that I can say it wasn't me that did this? Either I can say there was none that did it, or I can say that it was that person that did it. Can I blame somebody else? That's repudiation. Information disclosure. Well, the known one is like the Sony hack. Everybody's credit cards available to anybody. Um, but information disclosure is totally about, okay, are we leaking data somehow? Is it possible to get data that they shouldn't from our system? And it can be as simple as we have an API where you get phone numbers, but you get the address as well. Nobody actually uses the address, but they still get it. Should we? I mean, 
leaking too much data in an API is pretty common. Denial of service, we're not just talking about huge amount of uh, attacks from bots, we're talking about any way that we can make this application not having doing its supposed what it's supposed to. So can I send, an, uh, send a request that changes the way it answers? Can I send a request that shuts it down? Can I make it unavailable in some way? That's a denial of service as well. But you also have the DDoS uh, problem with a lot of distributed attacks. But that's a pretty hard uh, thing to solve as well, by itself. And the last one, elevation of privilege, meaning that you're okay, you can log in, but you manage to do stuff as, as the admin, even if you're a normal user. Can you reach another URL that is the admin's URL? For example, is it possible to use the API, try to use the API as a lower uh, user or lower role and still manage to do it as an admin? Pretty common stuff, unfortunately. Okay, so we take all the parts of the, uh, of the diagram and talk around these, what can we do? If you think it's really uh, hard still, Microsoft made a help. A guy at Microsoft made a card game called Elevation Privilege. It's actually free, you can just download it or you can order it from them. Uh, which is a card game where you try to f sort of play around, okay, what kind of attacks can you do with this system and the one that has the worst attack wins. Just uh, getting ideas around it for the first time if it's really, really hard to get in this feeling of how to be a hacker, which is really hard. Okay, that was step two. Now we say that we have an image of what our system looks like and we've talked about what can go wrong in the current system. So we're actually talking about legacy code here. It's already what we have done. Maybe we uh, included what we were thinking of doing, but it's not what the new stuff. How do we catch new stuff? So what we do, we have a backlog review as everybody else or backlog grooming as, or it wasn't the word anymore. What did they call it? Refinement, refinement. refinement right. Sorry, I have the wrong, wrong word here. Backlog refinement session. But we have a special one right now, just to keep going, which is looking from a security perspective. We just take the product owner and the security expert in the team. We're trying to make sure that all the teams have one that is trying to get, uh, be the security expert for the team. It's always better if it's in the team. From the beginning, that's never the case. So we have a security support group that helps the teams in the beginning to get it going and that's where they also have these guilds more or less where we talk about security and getting them up to date. So we have a special backlog session where we just talk about new stuff and see what can go wrong here and the reason for this is only to make sure that the estimates gets correct. That's the actual reason because if security isn't in the uh, task when you get it into estimation session it will never get into the task because you can never add stuff and not saying that it takes more time. So the only reason we talk about it there is to make sure that when the estimate session comes, we make sure that we know that, okay, it might be this and this we need to do as well, or at least think about it can be an issue. It might be a risk that we need to add. So that's the reason why we have these sessions. It's not a looking into security very, very much. It's just saying that highlight that this has implications. Make sure that you think about it when you estimate. So that's the reason we have that. Um, it, for some team it's been really hard, so we actually help them with checklists. So when should we saying that it might be more to do? Um, checklist is not always agile, but it's a way of actually getting people to look at the right areas at least. I think I have an example of a checklist here uh, for one of the teams where we just added, so will the, how will this new functionality be accessed? Is it the same way as before? Is it new ways? Does that implicate anything? Um, we have the, how is this, we have addresses in the database and some of the addresses are of the word of class protected identity, so we, everybody, all systems shouldn't be able to reach them. Are we talking about those in this case? How will that be handled? Can we flag them to make sure that we handle this identity somehow special that it's not actually um, readable. <coughs> um, will this add new things to our threat model? Okay, if it does, maybe we should have a new threat modeling session just to update the diagram and talk about it. 
and uh, is there a new role for users in this case or do we change the entity in a way that we need to think about that we update all validations as well. So this is just an example of a checklist that we had to help people help this backlog uh, refinement. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, session to get the, uh, that they know they should add stuff. So that was number three. So now we talked about the image, the handling of the system that we already have, and how do we handle new stuff. So to be able to work in an agile world, for me, I need st in continuous integration because otherwise I don't get the feedback as I want to. Uh, so can we add stuff to help us? Uh, we've used static code analyzers, we've used dynamic code analyzers, and we use penetration testing tools in our continuous integration environment to get an early feedback as quick as possible. If it's possible to do, it depends both on time and money. Uh, there is examples of all of uh, these continuous integrations you know about. Uh, <coughs> but we can also add some, whoa, add some kind of robustness testing. <laughs> Uh, into the continuous integration environment. So when you have your unit test, integration test, and system test maybe, uh, we add uh, part of FUS testing. FUS testing means that you, in, the, in a simple sense, it means that you uh, uh, send a lot of data to the system and see if it crashes. Or not like maybe a lot, maybe strange data in borders and so on, and automate it. So there's different ways of doing that and that makes it more and more looking like real data. So there's all these different tools to do that as well. And talking about analyzing the code, the idea is that we try to look for complexity and rule breaking using tools like SonarCube, which is free and really good, but a lot of false positives if you don't uh, configure it, so it's time consuming. But at least, and, and SonarCube can't really find security issues. It's not that it finds. It finds complex code that might hide security issues. Trying to get the complexity down in a code has its own value in a system. So that's why we use it. There's even better tools like Coverty and Fortify, but they cost money. So depending on your team, uh, whatever you're working with, it might be worth the money. Coverty is quite cumbersome to handle. Uh, because it's a lot of configuration to get it set up, but when you have it set up, it's really good at finding bad code that has security implications. And Fortify is also good, and they also have like an online version now that is possible. So analyzing code can help you. It's hard, but it might. And the that was number four. And the last one is adding activities to the sprint. And this is where we actually try to get it good. Because uh, we have all these different activities that we talk about. We have the diagram, we have the, that you should be updated and the system should be updated. We have this that I a little vaguely talked about as fuss testing. When should we do that? We can't do all of it in, one, in every sprint. So what do we do? <coughs> the idea there is that we have buckets. I don't know if anybody have ever used bucket system in your agile projects. Has any of you seen that before? The idea is that we have different buckets that we add, and in these buckets we put activities. We have a verification bucket where we put like the FUS testing and data flow analysis into, and we have a design bucket where we take what are our cryptology right now, how does it work, we how is privacy working right now, and maybe we, for some regulations we need to update documents regarding those areas. We have a planning document talking about uh, privacy. Do, do, we, do we need to plan a new test that we should run specific for that? How do we handle internal symbols in our uh, code? Is that coming, it goes, how do we handle when we need to debug? Do we, where do we have our internal symbols, for example? And other stuff. Uh, here it also in planning it might be added, how do we handle incidents right now that happens? So the idea that we put all of these activities into the buckets and then whenever a sprint starts, we say, you need to take one thing from each bucket. So every sprint, we have three time-boxed activities, one from each bucket, that makes sure that at least this, uh, one of these activities gets into the sprint. 
So, okay, this sprint will do a short fuzz testing, or this sprint will do a look at cryptology, how long these are time boxed and how often they should make sure that they're done, depends on the team. Uh, for some of the teams we have like an Excel chart where we have all the different uh, activities and saying that we need down, this one should be done once a year at least. This should be done every three weeks at least. And then it has a counter and so we see, okay, for the next sprint we probably need to take those three. Or how do we feel like, okay, should we, how should we update this list? So it's a way of working with activities, more or less non-functional requirements that has to be done in the system, uh, but we can't do it every sprint, so our way of doing it is not doing it every sprint, but at least having a clue of that we do it now and then. So that's where we, uh, we handle those uh, par uh, testing activities that takes too long. So that was my short recipe of whatever I found that actually works in our teams. That we make sure that we have this architectural overview, that we have done threat modeling session and we have those planned for an interval, maybe not the sprint interval, but at least an interval. We, had, we are reviewing all new requirements. We are looking at the tool chain as often as we can. And we are adding activities that is your activities for handling security in the teams. So that's our way of doing it. And I think it actually works for us really good. Hopefully you took something with you that might be something you can use your teams to working on security in the uh, activities. So that's how it works for us. So now it's your part. This doesn't work for us for <laughs> any questions or ideas around this. Or did you just all fall, fell asleep after lunch? Uh, just a question from, a, let's say, a perspective of, of um, time and some money. Uh, how uh, implementing all, all these tools and adding all those activities that are ex exclusively non-functional, uh, how that uh, prolongate the, let's say, cost or give the overhead or if I, let's say, if I want to include all of these activities, should I say, okay, but this will slow down my delivery of funds of, of business values for 10%, for 5%, for 20%? <laughs> should is I something like that possible? <laughs> should I answer? It depends. Uh, no, uh, well, the idea is that if we do this, we don't get it back as a bug, as at every time. Um, and we don't want security bugs because that can kill a company. So it depends on the risk that the product owners are willing to take. And the, the whole concept here is you shouldn't make a secure system. You shouldn't make it a secure application. You should make it secure enough. Because making a perfectly secure system is useless. Because that means three-part authentication and, well, ideas, I mean, you can always overdo security, but that's not the, product, the, the thing you should do. You should make sure that you know what the level of security in your application is. And after a threat modeling session, the team knows what they sort of expect. Because drawing the diagram, that's something we do with the team. But having a threat modeling session, we need to have the product owner there. He's the one that says, okay, that is something we need to actually do. But you can't get anything prioritized without having them on the session to get to know why this is important. Because putting stuff in the backlog, that's easy. Getting it prioritized and actually done, that's hard. So the product owners has to be there. And they have to choose what are the risk level that we're going to have in this software. Because that's a brainstorming session, so they are there. So that's how we handle it. We make sure that they decide it. And that when they have the hard job, then. <laughs> that's so true. Yeah. So you had a question? I have, actually have two. Mm -hmm. uh, first question is, uh, when you add the product required to make something secure, do you, is it, do you make it transparent to the client, or you just add it as overhead to some standard tasks? For example, if you're securing some queries to prevent uh, parameter tampering or something, do you add it to the feature as additional uh, time, or you actually write to client and says, we need to invest in securing queries for, I don't know, two days? How yeah. do you approach that? Well, it's two parts in that, because we want the original task that is implement a functionality to include make sure that it's safe. So every new task that is uh, estimated should include make sure that this includes our 
way of handling it, which means by uh, we are using uh, uh, what do you call? Yeah, well, anyway, that we ha handle that we shouldn't have tampering in our system. So we, we, that's in all new requirements. To have a session saying we need to fix all the old, it's uh, well, if we need to do it, we, we often have it uh, transparent for the client because they are product owners in the end, or they are the one talking to the product owners, and they want it safe as well. If a client says, we don't think this is important. That was the second question. Yeah, then we have a, I mean, that's sort of what I'm saying. If they think it's important, they just said that. So in, in the worst case, write it down. <laughs> I mean, it's still they that own the money. So for us being consultants, we push for the client saying, okay, to do, this is the risk if we don't do it. Are you fine with that? If he is, well, we don't want to deliver a bad system, so we try to push that as hard as we can, of course. But it, they are the ones with the money in the end. If it's your system, you have to decide yourself if this is important. This, I mean, having priority or parameterized queries is something that every developer should do in every SQL query without having to write it uh, specifically in the requirements. Some people think because that's how you write a SQL query today. You don't do concatenating of, a, of a SQL. That's bad practice. But that's back to having the uh, having the uh, your, that you actually own your code, making taking responsibility for your code and all of that part. But then talking about other another thing that's really hard on a website like uh, cross scripts, uh, cross uh, uh, cross site scripting which is really, really hard to make sure you don't have anywhere. That's hard to say that all developers should just make sure. That's something you usually have to test to find. So we, we use it transparently, mostly. It's an answer on that. We had one situation where the client was insisting on something that is bad practice. And that, that's the part where you start to think, should we deliver this because it's bad reputation for the company if you mm -hmm. actually deliver something that is real. Let's say it's a case with clear text passwords. Mm -hmm. Which is basically become a hub for uh, mm -hmm. for hacking other sites if your database is taken. So that's something that you that it really can harm your company. Mm -hmm. Even if you sign some contract, would you go with that? Thing? Would you implement a system that has clear text passwords? I mean, I I totally say that we shouldn't, but I'm not the one deciding all the time. <laughs> But I, I mean, it's, it's for the team to, if they think that, okay, the only way that we can actually be proud of what we're doing is making sure that everything else takes more time and we'll solve that issue as well. That's sometimes what happens, doing background work without knowing the client should know. And that never works in the end because it's, well, you have a bad relationship with the client and you just want to get out of there as quick as possible in the end anyway. I, well, I can't really say, no, you should, of course not, because that's never true, but I wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, if, well, if they don't want to uh, have a system that works, should we deliver it? Well, it's up to you. Should you? <laughs> Depends on how long you want to live in the end, isn't it? <laughs> if anybody else can do it within the same time, make sure it's secure. Well, but then, yeah, it's tough. I agree. I, can't, I don't really have an answer if, they, if you have a client that doesn't agree with security. Hmm? Any other questions? Good, then I'm done, thank you.